And welcome to another episode of SPCs Unleashed. Today we reprise episode three and uh, we're here to talk about agile teams and we're in the safe hands of Stefan as distracted by Ali with uh, the fourth. But Stefan, over to you. Perfect. Welcome. Uh, in the last episode, we talked about lean thinking people and agile teams. And today in this episode, we are really diving into what is an agile team. And with that, we're back in the safe sports analogy. We'll talk about giants. We'll talk about legends. And we'll talk about goat teams. And uh, you will hear Mark talking about why he's keen about Scrum Masters as creationists. We see Nico on his Greek Easter holiday, and he's definitely floating in the zone. And Ali is back. Welcome, Ali. He's looking for a rhythm-based effectiveness. And looking at the calendar, and thanks for the input, Ali, as well, may the fourth be with us today so oh yes oh yes perfect perfect gents what's your passion about agile teams let's start with ali uh hi everyone um so the passion for agile teams i i figured that um this uh, dimension is probably one of my favorites uh why because it's about what it is really about um, small, little, self-organizing teams of smart people that are finding better ways of creating cool things uh, by learning it from each other and, uh, well, trying to have some fun along the way. And um, honestly, you know, it, this is sort of where it starts. You start with uh, having a small little team that becomes effective. And then if you try to dumb that down, which is what I try, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little later, is... Um, just the ability to operate in a rhythm. Some people call it cadence, other people call it sprints, but just having a sort of a rhythm, that rhythm becomes routine and routine allows for sort of continuous improvement. It just, you know, all good ideas that I've seen, anything that we call agile, uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that eventually became a best practice or whatever that pops out of small little teams that are working in that that kind of a rhythm so i've you know it's it's those ideas uh is what fuels me um and i'll talk way more about that in uh, the next questions thank you very much over to you nico in greece how about your passion yeah, perfect. I just finished the military singing the national anthem. That's why I was in mute. I hope you didn't hurt everything. <laughs> so what's my passion is if you look who is doing the development uh, work, it's the teams. So it's really the foundation. And what I love in this dimension is when you see that the teams are working in flow. In flow meaning work is just done and it, it doesn't feel like hard work, but at the end you achieved so much. And seeing many, many teams being in flow, that's my passion. Cool. And finally. Mark. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny going back to our roots with with agile teams because you know I was an an agile team guy for a long time before I was a safe guy. And if there's one thing that I feel super passionate about, it's developing great scrum masters who'll develop great teams. I think it's one of the most poorly understood and leveraged role in the agile world, and uh, it can be so powerful when you get the right scrum masters with the right amount of passion for their job. That sounds promising for today. So let's dive into this dimension of Agile teams. We have different aspects to cover, and I would like to start with the first one. If you look at the uh, description of the dimension, it says it's guided by the Agile Manifesto, and teams can use different approaches like Scrum, like Kanban, or a hybrid as their core team method. So I'm curious, guys. What practices of Agile did you coach to foster the right attitude in Scrum or Kanban or a hybrid uh, um, kind of uh, way to work? So what's your experience and what were your focal points when it came to these practices regarding Agile? And I'm handing over the talking stick to Ali again. All righty. Thank you. Um, I'm not, I don't know about all of you guys. But I tend to uh, feel that 
teams that are really starting with any form of agile, they tend to um, be helped, supported more by adopting any form of Scrum than Kanban. Somehow the the, the you know being able to adopt something that is you know, probably also the reason why it's the most used framework for uh, an agile team on the planet. But somehow the I think it, it gives it gives some comfort and some structure for a way of working. So and and I I've seen that that somehow the adoption rate just it 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 it's easier. Well, how should I call it? The adoption is easier. And what I typically do, what I've learned to do over time, all started with a mistake, is actually to even start with even less scrum, sort of a lean scrum, uh, or or sort of a scrum on a diet kind of thing. So if there was, we start with just the iteration, just having a two-week stint with a moment at the end for review. And that sort of it fuels and it generates everything else. So after a couple of these check moments after two weeks, which eventually will be split up into a review and into a retrospective, you know, people will, the team will figure out, you know what, yeah, it would be good to, yeah, it would actually be good to understand what we are going to do the upcoming, you know, the, the, the next upcoming two weeks. Excellent. Well, maybe it would be good to have a backlog, a single one-dimensional list containing all of the work that comes to you uh, or a, a work that uh, you're going to spend, uh, spend time on. Um, well, okay, then we know, but then maybe after another iteration, we figure out that we've overcommitted or we just pulled work out of a backlog. Uh, and then, well, maybe it would be better if we would sp spend some time together to just pull the right work and enough work uh, out of that backlog. And that's it. Bingo! You know, you install the so-called uh, iteration planning or the sprint planning. And this somehow, it just, it, it's intuitive. And I've been doing that ever since. Uh, and it takes some time, but that basically means that the teams, they, they invent their own scrum, which you know, in hindsight, if you'd open up the Scrum Guide, they've invented the Scrum Guide. So, but then it comes from themselves. They've created their own nuances, and you know, I can be like a little proud little boy over there. Like, uh, look at that's my team. I didn't do anything, but the team itself figured out Scrum. Fantastic. I yeah, was a... I like that. that's, that's, that's it for me. Yeah, Mark, there, go for there, it. There, there was a great article Christina Wadke put out this week. And she was talking about the psychology of temporal cycles and, you know, go figure, lots of big words. Um, but, you know, of course, Christina Wodke, very famous for her book on OKRs, Radical Focus. But one of the things she pointed out with short-term rhythms is that psychologically you get an energy reset. You know, when you run a weekly rhythm, a two-week yeah. rhythm, yeah. You, you get to the end and then you've got a fresh beginning. And there's a energy and a whole bunch of psychology reset that comes with it. And it really resonated with me to go. It's not something we talk a lot about when we talk about sprints or iterations, but it's so present. Yeah, yeah. Fully I understand. really love that. Yeah. And, and you guys already mentioned that, like, we shouldn't do, like, copy-paste, just applying something that people don't understand because success is much more. And, and handing over to Nico, what success for you when you apply those those methods, when you apply those frameworks or those approaches? How would you how would exactly. you that? I, I, I can build up on Oli's story, uh, which is really amazing. I like when people create their own environment where they are the master of what they are doing. Of course, you need somebody helping them because otherwise you invent something that doesn't work. Uh, no user interaction or uh, uh, let's make a. Uh, the sprint uh, or whatever uh, five months long so you need somebody challenging them but people uh, being able to in to invent their own uh, process uh, it's really cool and at the end they invented scrums so in my case i had I had a, 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 had a team of teams they invented safe uh, and at the end they asked me uh, nico do, do you know safe so yeah are we doing safe so yes you just invented similar things uh, some namings were different but you, you you invented other stuff yourself so what is 
key to success is not having a book and playing by the book and having these rituals just because it's written there. So I have to do a retro. Uh, I have to do a daily stand up. Uh, okay, let's uh, six people stand around 15 minutes and uh, pray what they have done last day with a with a uh, something on their head and so, in, in the hand. And so, okay, a phone called Maria and then a phone called Herbert. And then a, I don't care. It's not about what have you done yesterday because you will get your money anyway. So just people uh, read the book and say, uh, and have three questions, 15 minutes. We have to stand up because the meeting has to go exactly 15 minutes. And what you need is scrum masters who know what is important to achieve success. And with that in safe, you need scrum masters and scrum masters and team coaches and RTs who are together a virtual team. So what I try to do in a safe environment or an environment with safe <laughs> is uh, creating a virtual team with Scrum Masters uh, RTs so they together steer everything. And with that, I mean that the Scrum Master is not only responsible for his own team, he's also responsible to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 coach, mentor, mentor is a better word, to mentor other Scrum Masters, to help them in the struggle in retrospectives. So it's, it's not really me and my team, it's uh, me and my virtual team, and I help my, my bodies and my peers to to improve also in their own uh, uh, teamwork. And that's uh, the success. I think uh, being able to understand what Agile really is in heart and, and follow this and build a virtual team of all these Scrum Master team coaches, RTEs you have. Thank you for that springboard, Nico. You said Agile at heart. Uh, if you look at sports people who are famous and if you ask them what kind of inspired you along your career, they always say at a young age, I looked up at those giants in my sport. And I saw on the prep notes, you came up with that term giants. Uh, Mark, please lead us into that domain. So playing in the domain of giants, in a lot of the early safe collateral that Dean had, he would say we stand on the shoulders of giants. Because, you know, if you look back at, you know, where was the beginning of SAFE and the first book Dean published, Scaling Software Agility, I think it was about 2007, he went through 15 or so commonly used agile methods and said, what's the heart of the method? What are the contexts it works well in? Where does it struggle to scale? Where does it help to scale? And right in the beginning, SAFE was taking this huge body of knowledge and expertise and experience and saying, let's synthesize that together into something bigger. And for a lot of us who'd lived that life, you know, I before SAFE, I'd done 12 years of team level agile. And I, I came in and SAFE was like, well, this is the stuff for bigger beasts. But there was that huge body of knowledge, and I kept plugging into and deepening the body of knowledge at the team level stuff. And I think, you know, if you're an SPC and SAFE is your introduction to agile, SAFE doesn't go super deep on an Agile team because there's this massive body of knowledge out there on what makes a great Agile team. You, you've got to go back and you've got to tap into that basic stuff because if you haven't got Agile teams, you haven't got nothing when it comes to scale. I fully agree, Mark. Uh, if, if you don't get the basics right, you're in sports, you would say you don't play the sports right, right? You might kick a football or you might kick a ball around, but it's not scoring. You're not hitting the goal. So in that analogy, let, let, let's get one step further. Creating a team, coaching a team, and you mentioned that, Nico, right? Um, the scrum master or team coach has a crucial role for the teams. Based on your experience uh, as change agents, as coaches, how did you support finding the team scrum master or team coach? Because I think that's a crucial, um, yeah, it's a crucial thing to find the right people. What were your challenges and how did you overcome them? And Nico, uh, you, you just pushed it off in your last statements. Coaching, finding the right coach, finding the right uh, Scrum Master. What's to consider? Exactly. Let's, let's stay in the sports paradigm. If you, if you need a new trainer, you don't just hire somebody who has just a diploma. Hey, I have a diploma degree. I'm a trainer now and I have the highest grade ever. You have to hire me for your team. And you will say, okay, let's take the one with the highest score. And that's our new trainer and the new coach we have. Great. But with Scrum or, 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 or Agile, some companies do this. So, oh, we need a Scrum master. 
there were some people who went to a scrum training. Let's uh, put them hostile and say, you're now scrum master too. You can develop 80% of the time or 70%, but the rest 30%, you organize some tea, some rooms, and you're scrum master. <laughs> At the end, yeah, you have somebody serving tea and not uh, um, helping the people developing. So you need people who have the passion to develop other people's. You need to find people who are coaches. This could be, by the way, old project leaders who really cared for team dynamics. Uh, so you see in, in Safe in Scrum, uh, uh, there is no uh, project lead anymore. But those people have had, some of those had the skills of caring for people, developing people. And those people uh, we need because uh, these Scrum masters are really important or team coaches are important for the teams. So if I have to choose, uh, do I choose a Scrum master who is half developer? Or do I use a Scrum Master who serves two teams? I would always choose the Scrum Master who serves two teams. Even if it's not the best solution, it's it's the better of two worst options. The worst, more worst option would be, let's take a developer with a Scrum training and uh, call him also Scrum Master. Because if when something is on fire, you need to know which fire you're gonna, you're gonna uh, uh, put down. And if you have two jobs uh, with 50%, you have two fires and you will just go there where you like working, and usually it's your daily job, which is developing, and then you just end up with Scrum Master on paper. So uh, yeah, find those people, develop this, uh, and yeah, you need this radar to find out which people are the best for, for this job, and not a certificate, certificated one, certified one. Let's stick with finding the right person or the right people. What are your thoughts, Mark? Ah, uh, look, I'm going to share two stories as a backdrop to this. Uh, there's a story of the first big government agency that I coached in this world, uh, and they had a role that was basically a team lead. The title for the role was EL1, uh, and it meant they had probably 10 or 15 years with the agency, uh, and they were managing a roughly team-sized group of people. And they went, they're our Scrum Masters. And it was an absolute disaster uh, because... You know, they were not wired for generating a world of change. And in actual fact, over the next year, one of those turned out to become a good scrum master in every other case. It wasn't great and we went a different way. But let's talk about probably the fourth or fifth agency that I coached, again in government. And this one was a, a business led adoption. And so a business enabled arts and they talked to me and they said, okay, Mark, what are the attributes that make a great Scrum Master? And I, of course, talked a lot about soft skills, empathy, rapport, facilitating the team through, team through conflict, uh, you know, mentoring, growing teamwork. And they said, beautiful, thanks, great advice. And I went back a few weeks later to do the Safe Scrum Master training, uh, which I liked it about a week before the first PI planning. And we filled the room up and we walk around the room and it's like, who are you? What's your background? And I had 12 scrum masters, only one of whom had come out of a technology background. And it's like, this is weird because it's like an unspoken expectation for me. I expect product owners to come from a business world, scrum masters to come from a technology world. And it's like, I've got this room full of tech pe um, business people. And so I was talking to the sponsor that night and I said, that was a really surprising mix that you gave me. And she said, well, when you spoke to us about the characteristics, we've got all of these people who come from a social work background with psychology degrees and amazing soft skills. And so that's who we picked. And it was a really fascinating journey because they walked in to lead these teams and they knew nothing about the craziness of common technology process, but they knew everything about building a great team. And it was one of the most successful group of scrum masters in terms of building amazing teams that I'd ever encountered. I nice. really like that. It, you mentioned the journey, Mark, and uh, handing over to Ali, um, a journey can be very versatile and different. And if, if you start with new teams, uh, what are your thoughts? What are, is your experience when it comes to team coaching and, and scrum masters? I'm, um, I must confess I have, um, I have a bit of a struggle here and always have a struggle here somehow for some reason. Uh, and so it must be me because I don't know, I've tried all kinds of things and other people have issue, don't have that issue, but I don't know, it must be me. So what do I, what, what do I mean? 
Um, somehow, and maybe that's because I work in a lot of hardware environments, so engineering companies with majority of mechanical, electrical, uh, optics, engineers, and so forth. The role of a scrum master doesn't come naturally. Uh, what Mark just said is, uh, you know, typically the expectation is that the scrum master is indeed somebody that has a technical background, but also has the sort of the the the, the interest uh, and the maybe the natural ability to create a team. There's always this one person who is just spending a little bit more time in helping others to do their job and to do it well. Um, so, and people understand that, but. Whenever an agile coach comes in, me, and um, uh, the, the, the company is, you know, has a sort of a push to go agile uh, or agile at scale or whatever framework is being used, then the role of the Scrum Master is not a natural one. Yes, there are team leads that have indeed these kind of, you know, the, the, the additional responsibility to uh, 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 develop, uh, develop a team a little bit, but they do that much more over the axis of, you know, over the technical axis, typically more the, the senior engineer uh, who is, uh, who is um, developing the team over there. But the, um, uh, the, the role of a scrum master is typically not directly understood. So I'm struggling with that. Um, and the thing is, experience always shows that you need a scrum master. So the moment that you start a team without a scrum master, you know, be, very soon you'd understand why a Scrum Master is needed because the team just, you know, will fail to operate, will not have a, the, the rhythm that it needs. Um, if you'd have a, a team that has a Scrum Master that doesn't have the ability to provide a mirror to the team, maybe because the Scrum Master has a little bit of the tendency or the idea that, that he or she is like a, a team manager, you know, very quickly, you'd understand that does that doesn't work as well. So we need a real scrum master, um, or having what what Nico mentioned, having a scrum master that is spending, you know, twenty percent or thirty percent of their time being a scrum master, which basically means you're sort of a scrum secretary because you're the person who plugs the laptop into you know the HDMI cable into the laptop and and you know puts Jira on a screen and. Basically, that's it, because the rest of your time you need to spend it on developing code or developing, uh, designing a module. Yeah, <laughs> you do that a couple of sprints, a couple of iterations, and you'd understand that, that that doesn't work as well. But but for some reason, for me personally, I'm very curious about how you guys think, but for me personally, the the the, the, the need of a good Scrum Master and the right type a scrum master, it, it needs to be experienced first before it's understood. And I've been, I understand the concept, I can explain it, I'm, I've been giving trainings uh, since 2009, but for some reason, people need to understand it by experiencing it, and then they're like, ah, okay, now, okay, okay, yes, we need to have, we need to take this scrum master thing seriously. So I got to come back because, of course, I am so passionate about scrum mastery. And I'm going to wind the clock back many, many years, probably nearly 20 years, to my first experience with a Scrum Master. Uh, so I was the tech lead for a team. We had been doing XP. We decided we were going to add Scrum. And so we'd read the Scrum Traffic Light book, and it described a Scrum Master. We went, ah, oh, that's the person who keeps all the noise away from us so we can get on with the job. And they get no influence because, of course, they're a servant leader, so we still get to call all the shots. And so we told our company, you need to hire a Scrum Master for us. And poor guy got hired, came in, and every time he tried to add any value, we went, no, 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 you're the Scrum Master. You've got no opinion. Um, <laughs> you're here so we can get on with building great products. And so after a year, and I don't know how it lasted a year, he left. He went, there's just nothing here for me. And I wound up being Scrum Master as a hatted role. So I was still the tech lead. I was also the Scrum Master. And, you know, what did it mean? I did what most people think a Scrum Master does, which is the bare minimum. Keep Jira up to date, <laughs> run the events, spend my life cutting code. And then 
slowly but surely I recognized, hey, if I spend a little bit more time on some of the team building human side of Scrum Mastery, my team works better. And I might be the best coder on the team because, of course, I was the best coder on the team, uh, in my own head at least. But, you know, putting that time into the teamwork just paid dividends. And so I went over the course of three years as a Scrum Master from Scrum Mastery being probably 10 or 15% of my life to being 80 or 90% of my life. And I love having Scrum Masters from a technical lead background. Uh, It's my favorite type of Scrum Master. Because any team trying to go down the agile path has to figure out technical agility and having a scrum master from a tech background who's going, my job is to help my team evolve down this path and I'm going to lead them and where the technical change aspects come from, I've got a, a level of respect that enables me to do that. I think it's great. Now, having said that, I think not a lot of tech people take naturally to soft skills. Uh, so this kind of there's a piece of it. A lot of resistance, I think, for people is suddenly we have to hire a scrum master for every team and we don't understand the value of the role. And it's why I actually like find your people who are interested. And it doesn't matter whether they come from a BA background or a tech lead background or a testing background or even a project management background sometimes. Um, You know, find people who are interested and take them on the journey. But at the same time, You've got to know what an amazing Scrum Master looks like. And so I like to suggest seed in, right? Find one or two. I like kind of a one to five ratio. One amazing Scrum Master you've brought in to work alongside the four or five Scrum Masters you're growing from within. And and you've got to find those amazing Scrum Masters. And it's not the ones who proudly tell you they're certified. When I listen to you guys, when, when I listen to you guys, and I'm coming to you, Nico, soon, um, I, yeah. I remember one of uh, the coaches telling me, you can't create legends, legends emerge over the time. Yeah. Finding the right people and let them have an evolutionary path becoming this awesome Scrum Master or team coach, right? And what I really find helpful before handing over to Nico is self-squadification. Is, is one aspect I learned from Sandy Mamoli, from M. Uh, Campbell Pretty. They have awesome stuff that you can use if you build teams, if you build arts, let them find their spot where they can contribute the best towards an existing or a to be created context, right? But finding the right people, uh, I can see Nico, you want to you wanna tell us something? Yeah, yeah. I had years ago a, a team who told me, I, we are so mature, we don't need a Scrum Master, we can do it by our own, just a floating Scrum Master. I told them then, yeah, but in Champions League, you have uh, more than one trainer, one more coach, and those people are also experienced. And uh, they, they uh, why do they have five coaches and not nobody? So you cannot compare, it's sports, it's different, it's not the same. And then uh, I remember, uh, Mark, uh, last episode, you talked about the Marshmallow Challenge. Then I changed the Marshmallow Challenge. I gave them two iterations. Instead, the original Marshmallow Challenge goes 18 minutes. I gave them nine minutes and nine minutes. And in between, I gave them three minutes for a retrospective. And they built up small teams and let them do the Marshmallow Challenge with their floating Scrum Master. And then after the exercise, of course, uh, as usual, uh, two of three teams fail uh, building something that is stable. I asked them, OK, and how well went your retrospective? Oh, very well. So was it a retrospective at all, what you've done there? Because I heard you still continue planning instead of thinking about the process. And then I said, oh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, oh, that wasn't a retrospective at all. And yeah, and who was in charge that everybody has a voice? Oh, yeah, we had some silent people who didn't talk at all at the retrospective and nobody noticed. So and are you sure your floating Scrum Master thing works when you tell me you're doing a retrospective and then after asking you tell me you know, you've done not a retrospective? I think you still need a Scrum Master even if you're really, really mature, you need just a different one. And that was uh, yeah, one of the stories when I just changed the marshmallow challenge to prove that, yeah, you need a scrum master in the middle for doing the retro. Otherwise, you just stay three minutes, eh, don't worth the retro, let's continue working. Let's have three extra minutes to build stuff. So perfect. Uh, so far, we talked about giants. We can stand on those shoulders. Let's find the right people and let the legends emerge over the time helping the teams become good teams. Now, let's switch to the teams. 
In the SAFE framework, we talk in that dimension about teams who will map to one of the four team topologies, clarifying their role in the value stream. I find that interesting. Why? First of all, it's challenging, and it could lead also to some anti-patterns. So creating GOAT teams, teams that are really greatest of all times and have those high-performant uh, teams, how did you guys uh, use team topologies? What were the challenges? What were the benefits? How did you deal with it? And uh, yeah, let's start again with Mark. So the Agile that I learned a long time before team topologies came out, we talked about two types of Agile teams. We talked about feature teams and component teams. And feature teams had all the skills to do end-to-end -end value, and they were good. And component teams had all the skills to build widgets, and they were bad. Right, It was a very binary, polarizing view of the world. And you know, there was a reality, particularly at scale, where you're often just dealing with such a complex world that you literally can't put all those skills on a single team. Right? And that was the job of an art, was to go, actually, if I can't get perfect cross-skilling at the team level, maybe I can get good, the right cross-skilling at a team of teams level. And so we were building these more nuanced team structures. What I loved with Team Topologies was it gave us a language that was a little bit more nuanced than, you know, feature good, component bad, but it also gave us a lot of explicit guidance, right? So for example, a really easy one is the platform topology, right? A lot of people call themselves a platform team who aren't really a platform team, right? If your team is driven by dependency and you're just a bunch of specialists piled together, you're a complicated subsystem team, not a platform team. And, you know, if you're a platform team, you're out there, you're thinking about customers, you're, you're, you know, really focusing on a proactive strategy rather than a reactive strategy. And, you know, the various ways that it said, well, if you're this topology, these are some of the ways that you're going to work best. These are some of the ways that you're going to collaborate with other teams. Just gave a beautiful, not just language, but also way of provoking you think you're this, well, let's actually look. Does your world look like this or what needs to change to enable you to be that? Uh, so, you know, that was probably my love with team topologies. But I think the other thing that, that's really important when you think about a greatest of all time team is you put together, let's say, a streamlined team, cross-functional group of people. Just because you pile them in the same team doesn't mean they're working in a cross-functional way, right? If you've got a whole bunch of highly specialized folks who basically, and you can tell these teams because you look at their backlog and you see a backlog for every team member, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, you know, we've got people bring these specializations in. How do we support each other? What is it we're going to do to go on the cross-skilling journey? And, you know, Nico made the comment last week, it's not everybody has to do everything, but how do we build the skills to support each other and help each other? And if you want a greatest of all time team, it's because you very deliberately built those T-shaped skills that enable you to support each other instead of just working individually. If I could, I would rewind the last one or two minutes and listen again to what just Mark said, right? Because I see some- We have a recording. In... <laughs> That's good. That's good. I'll do it. Anyway, um, uh, Nico, your experience when it comes to team topologies. Uh, same as Mark, I really love that they give us a vocabulary to distinguish between a zero and one and say there's more uh, uh, to be. Uh-oh, I think Greece is he's kicking in on Nico. Oh, no, he's back. Oh, I'm back. Sorry. So uh, last week I had a, a masterclass, or oh, two weeks ago I had a masterclass with Manuel, uh, one of the co-authors on platform teams. Uh, was really uh, huge. Still working on the summary for LinkedIn. Uh, I will post it soon, I hope. Uh, so what's really cool, uh, distinguish between zero and one, there is more in between. And also still, if we have team topologies, we still have to use our brain and think what helps the teams uh, to, to involve. And once I did a really strange thing for many of my colleagues that they thought I just, uh, my brain kicked out and uh, I'm just crazy. I, I, did, I created two teams, one team with developers and one team with requirements engineers and business analysts. And all told me, are you crazy? What's about cross-functional and end-to-end -end and feature teams or are now assembly line teams? And in my case, it was so 
meaningful to have people starting a greenfield approach to let them work together who needs communication. In the beginning of this endeavor, of this project, uh, people had no idea what's, what's, their, uh, what's their pipeline is, uh, what their coding standard is, what tools they want to use, Git or not Git or something else. Git was, by the way, new then. Uh, should we go with something new and fancy or do we use uh, CVS or Subversion? <laughs> so they really had to find first how do they work together. The same with business analysts. Uh, they had no idea or not so much idea about the context of the current application. So the first sprints, they need the time to find their own language. And afterwards, I created a cool uh, retro, uh, like, a, like a, a, a bar camp or a, a word cafe. And on one table uh, was the question, when, you, when were you in flow? And then they said, yeah, when we worked over the teams. And as a result, they said, we, have now, we need now the streamlined teams. So what I want to say with that is uh, just because we have team topologies, it's a cool uh, tool, but sometimes you need something else. You need still this uh, not cross-functional teams just to enable the domains to start working, to start uh, con continuing growing in their knowledge. And then it's, it's something organized around value. And last time the value was knowledge gain gaining knowledge. And this time the value is building a product. So organized around value can be both, in my opinion. Perfect. I love that, uh, Nico. Go teams in the hardware domain, Ali. What's the perspective yes. on that? The thing is, in my opinion, um, team topologies can become too restrictive in the when used in the world of hardware. What do I mean with that? Um, the world of hardware is kind of uh, weird uh, because uh, uh, creating a cross-functional team with different types of engineering competences or engineering disciplines is just very difficult. I mean, imagine a mechanical engineer spent his or her entire life and studies understanding the dynamics of certain types of polymers or certain types of, um, of metals. And, and that's it, that's sort of the pure focus. And then all of a sudden, an agile coach comes by and says, you know what, you're going to sit in a team that is going to contain also an electrical engineer who has spent their entire life developing PCBs, FPGAs, ASICs, smart chips or chips on a, uh, uh, on a small little, uh, um, I always call it motherboards because then people understand what a PCB is, the green little thing that has chips on it. <laughs> These people, they're all really smart, really smart, really good people typically, but together, yeah, you know, they speak different languages. And, and on top of that, um, the, the process of developing a PCB is completely different from the process of developing a, I don't know, a metal cabinet like a metal cabinet that will contain wiring and devices and, and so forth and so forth. There's different things that you need to think about, about tolerances and about thermal performance and, and so forth and so forth. So there's just quite a gap between uh, these different, uh, different people with different backgrounds. So whenever, and I've tried it uh, uh, once, so whenever you introduce the team topologies rationale, even though the concepts are understood, but whenever you try to construct these types of teams, and I've done that with, uh, with an entire train, we had a huge team formation workshop, which was really interesting. But what you got is that you had a few small little teams who were sort of stream aligned, but what, that, what happened, they, yes, they were, they became the real goat, not the greatest of all time. No, they became the greatest of all teams because there were the few teams that had even the ability to develop something end-to-end. -end. And in most cases, you can't because a team is really focused on developing some part of a system's behavior or some part of a module. And with that module, you can't go to a customer and be like, oh, by the way, I have, I've made you a very small little module, which took us you know, a half a year with 14 uh, engineers. This module in itself doesn't doesn't say or doesn't do much. It's it's part of a big system. Um, so uh, let's say trying to break the wall between the different engineering disciplines. Yes, you know, huge value in that. But 
you need to take very small step, uh, steps in, in uh, finding ways, building bridges amongst engineering disciplines, uh, and then build upon that experience. Why? Because what, you, what happens is actually that, uh, you know, people that speak different languages start to learn each other's language a little bit. And, you know, it takes a lot of time and it's difficult to put a label on it. But whenever you sort of go into that direction, I don't see any teams that become a little bit more uh, cross-functional uh, to, uh, to go back. Listening to you guys summarizing, um, it's not about the categorization according to topologies. It's really finding your role in a development value stream and how, how does the contribution work to building great products? And with that, let's, let's kind of conclude on the team level again. Whatever type it is, whatever team topology, creating great products. And if we look at the responsibility wheel of a team, we have five different aspects or responsibilities. Which one sticks out for you guys? Who is taking over the talking stick? Any, me, 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 Nico? Go for it. Nico, can you hear us? Then probably Ali or Mark, you have to jump in. <laughs> yeah, let me let me pick up because Go I guess uh, Nico has some, uh, you know, I think Greece... Uh, the sun and the beautiful temperature is just affecting the internet connection. I guess that's what's happening. Um, but what uh, um, uh, if we're talking about um, the what kind of responsibility would I uh, would I try to tackle first? Well, in the end, I think as a as a team, the ability to build some form of a rhythm uh, and getting feedback by delivering value would probably be my choice out of all of the responsibilities of a team. Why? Because that in itself, you know, by doing it in small steps, in a rhythm, in a cadence, you try to deliver something, you get feedback, and that generates the learning that you need to really find your way of working. So I, that would be my choice. How about you, Mark? Uh, I'm with you. So for me, working with a team, you've got to start with delivering value. Everything else in the responsibility wheel contributes to delivering value. Right? If you are improving, if you are getting feedback, if you are connecting with the customer, if you are improving your planning, they're all going to help you with delivering value. But you know, when you start working with a team, it's very easy for them to treat you as a distraction. We've got a job to do. We've got real work and you want us to do all this agile stuff. Start with the job they're there to do. Right? Help them do that. Learn from them. Something new will happen. And Nico has come and back, and are you back again, Nico? You're back with no sound. With, with your microphone. We can see <laughs> your mouth talking. But I guess, I guess he's trying to um, develop, uh, how do you call it, um, a bi-directional okay. internet connection now. Okay. So, um, <laughs> again, um, I, I'm, I second you, Mark and Ali, delivering value, right? That's the most crucial thing because um, if we don't deliver value, we're not learning, we're not contributing. We we can't tell why there is a team. And uh, yeah, zombie scrum, zombie safe, zombie Kanban doesn't work. It's about real value. So if we conclude with just one sentence, how would you summarize what we have talked so far or covered so far? Ali, how would you? Summarize. I guess I, you you actually you've taken the words out of my mouth. <laughs> Zombie Scrum doesn't Sorry. work. It's, it's funny that these the the book itself, uh, written by two Dutch guys, um, they actually they live and work uh, in the same city as where I live in, Christian and Barry. They uh, they've just they really create so much wonderful work uh, of you know uh, anti patterns uh, and. Um, uh, and tips and tricks about how to operate well. Uh, a fantastic material that they've created, and a lot of them is a lot of it is also open source, so really fantastic. But coming back to your question, Stefan, I'm sorry. Uh, my one sentence would be um, to stay humble, to just stay humble. Uh, your team knows how to work better, better than you. Uh, so, you know, starting with a small little like a rhythm, as I mentioned it with a sprint or the iteration uh, and you know and, and 
and us opening our ears and observing uh, what is happening and maybe asking a, a question here and there allows the team to find better ways of working, but the team knows it better than you. So stay humble. Thank you very much. Nico, can you still hear us? Are you still with us? Or I'm just so happy say? to see that. Uh, uh, yes, I hear you, but I, do you hear me? We yes. can hear you. Do you what? hear me? Yes, just great. Perfect, cent. perfect. I'm, I'm back. <laughs> this was, okay. can you hear me? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Uh, in my case, it's the nothing beats an agile team. Uh, if, you, if it's organized and reorganized or around value. So I just combined two nice statements from Saif. Perfect. Mark. Uh, if you don't have great teams, you'll never have great arts. Perfect. Very similar to Nico's statement, yeah. 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 And um, Not shorter. similar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> similar to Ali ones, uh, Ali's ones. Um, from our first recording, earn the right to breathe oxygen with your teams. How do you help them to, be, to become GOAT teams? How do we measure and grow? Guys, your journey, placing your stickies. We've got to start with yes, Nico because he couldn't make his mind up, right? <laughs> right, right. Nico has a whole <laughs> path on our prep notes. So Nico, you need to choose one, us. Nico. <laughs> I know, I know. It's 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 a it's a dark green one, the one I've chosen. So I started with uh, learning is important and improving. So I thought that first you need to continuously improve uh, ways of working with a team, and then I thought, yeah, value delivery is also important in the next category. So, okay, we need one team backlog because I've seen so many teams having hidden backlogs and so on. So I thought one backlog it is. And then I thought isn't it is irrelevant. So you need one backlog, you need continuous improvement, but at the end, if you're goal-oriented, and that's where my final stick is, you have all of this. If you are goal-oriented, you see your work you have to do. If you're goal-oriented, uh, uh, you, you, you work together as a team, so it's goal oriented. Was it last my cheating summary? <laughs> cool. Who's next? Ali, why don't you fire? Oh. Uh, okay, okay, I'll do. Um, I started with the same one as Nico chose, which is that if I want to measure one thing, there will be that our team should be goal oriented. But that's, I, I noticed that that's not where all teams start. Would be nice because I mean, if you'd open up the Scrum Guide, for instance, the Scrum Guide talks about the sprint backlog. I think once or twice or so, but talks, uh, but mentions the the sprint goal twenty two times or so, twenty three times in the entire document. Goal orientation is extremely powerful. However, that's typically not where you'd start, or at least what I what I see that you'd start. So I I went somewhere else, uh, very similar to. The, our last snippet um, uh, 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 that we went through um, as part of the responsibility wheel, so the, the way to deliver value. So I chose for all the way at the bottom of the measure and grow framework is uh, if I would measure one thing that the team incorporates feedback from customers and stakeholders throughout development. So get that feedback in. That's what I would measure first. I must over admit. Mark. So oh, I'll, I'll take over and then Mark, because I'm really curious why Mark put his sticky note where it is. But let me let me kick in first. Nico, I had a I had a really stressful mental phase before I put my sticky as well. And I didn't map my journey. But finally, I, I was looking for a measure and grow metric or a criteria that pays into delivering great products. And the only one I could, could place finally my sticky note was our team holds each other accountable for meeting our commitments. Because if you look at uh, uh, Lencioni's uh, dysfunctions of a team at the top of the uh, pyramid, if we don't hold each other accountable for delivering really great stuff, great products, great increments, are we just doing a little bit of Scrum, a little bit of Kanban, a little bit of Agile? That was my thinking. And now over to you, Mark. I'm really interested. So, I, look, I was torn. Uh, I think the longer we've done SPCs Unleashed and lived in this world of just a very competency-oriented view of SAFE, the more I've sat in what belongs in each place and how do you get one home for a discussion. So if I just looked at this list, I would have gone, well, of course, it's the team continuously improves. 
but that's relentless improvement, right? And so when I just distilled it all back down, I went, Agile Teams is all about teamwork. And like you, Stefan, I love Lencioni's Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Uh, it's like anybody who is trying to coach teams to be better teams. If you're an SPC and you haven't read The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, go read it. It's a wonderful book. And it puts forward this pyramid of dysfunctions you've got to address to get to high performance. And, you know, the base of the pyramid is trust. You've got to build trust with each other. Um, and, you know, that's the number one job for a scrum master is start to build some trust in the team. But then the second one is fear of conflict. Because a team that never figures out how to go through conflict will never grow together. Right? Happy teams that never argue don't tend to be high-performing teams. It's actually the differences between team members that create something magic together. And so that's why I lean in there because it's like if you can see those teams lean into conflict in a constructive way, amazing things will happen. Awesome. Um, let's look ahead what's missing when it comes to measuring and grow. I'd say let's start with Nico. He's back. Yes. Uh I'm back with a different uh, solution. So what's missing for me is because the Scrum Master team coach is so important. I would like to have a measurement how many real Scrum Master team coaches you have. So how much percentage of your work, if you have a Scrum Master role, of your uh, working work, do you do in coaching? Do you use this time in, in, in coach? So this is somehow uh, missing. Not having a Scrum Master, but is the Scrum Master really helping others, coaching others, uh, what we heard in this episode, this somehow is missing for me. I could second that, Nico, uh, going back to how much air am I as an SPC or change agent allowed to breathe with my teams? Are, I, am I really supporting the team and not just doing zombie scrum, zombie scrum master stuff like that, right? So is the team happy to see me when I turn up measure? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or are they trying to kick you out or kick <laughs> me out? <laughs> That's right. So I was fascinated by yours, Ali. They tried to kick me out. I was fascinated by yours, Ali. Yeah. Uh, so, I, so what measurement would be missing? I was like, I wonder if I would be if 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 I would measure anything. How many people who join the sprint review or iteration review are not from a team? So. What percentage is not a team member? So hence stakeholders, anyone else. That's so that's thing. that's uh, avoiding the zombie iteration reviews, right? Exactly. Where you know the team does an iteration review for itself. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I think we all picked measures that would be difficult to actually pull out of a tool. And uh, when I saw that you guys had gone that way, that gave, that gave me freedom. And I went with, what's the percentage of time that team members are interested in what each other's saying? Uh, there's a lot of whole teams activities in, in Agile. If you're not really a team, if you're a bunch of individuals, you spend a lot of time very bored in those conversations and they're low value. So it's a pretty interesting measure to have, I think. Nice one. Perfect. Thank you very much, much gents. Uh, concluding this session about Agile teams, I hope you find value in what you heard and what we discussed, and we wish you that the fourth be with you as a change agent, as an SPC, and unleash your power being a successful Scrum Master, being a successful uh, team coach. Thank you very much. And uh, next week, we're back, and we are heading into the land of Lean Agile leadership or mindset, values, and principles. Uh, but that, uh, that concludes things. I have to say, Ali, all your efforts failed. We had almost no Star Wars references through the entire discussion. I'm disappointed. But I reckon Chewbacca, there was a, there was a video, um, Jeff Sullivan put it out years ago about, you know, you need your Scrum Master. And they had Ian Sense playing this Scrum Master in a rugby journey. Uh, rugby jersey, who was yep. charging all over the place, throwing people out windows, sliding people along desks. Uh, it was a beautiful video, um, you know, and I had 
visions when I looked at your Star Wars of, you know, the scrum master who wears a Chewbacca suit and defends his team as Chewbacca. Me. It's about the team. And he throws. <laughs> That's the one. He's, actually, the dude, the, the, the man that is being thrown out of the window into the water was actually my thesis uh, um, uh, supervisor.